All righty. Thank you so much for coming. Woo, what a day, huh? So my name is Enrique Rubio, and I am the founder of Hacking HR. And just wanted to tell you before kicking off this uh, session tonight, about six months ago, I came to New York, maybe eight months ago. Um, it was snowing, you know, probably April or something. And I went running around Central Park. And there was uh, this woman arguing with a couple of guys in there. And when I was passing right next to them, the, one, the woman yelled at them, this is New York. So I'm guessing that that's why you came here tonight, because this is New York. And no matter the rain, no matter the snow, no matter the sleet, here you are. So thank you so much for coming. I'm super thankful that you, you know, decided to put your time uh, tonight coming to this event in spite of the, uh, of the conditions out there. We, I don't know what's going on with hacking HR. We haven't, we haven't found a way yet to hack the weather. We're getting close. Dennis is working on a tool that is going to do that what, about a year maybe from now, six months maybe, They're almost there. Uh, but when we had the hacking HR, New York chapter meetup, the, the first meetup that we had in, in New York about a month ago, it was pouring rain that day. So, and now we have the snow. So I don't know what's gonna be next, next year. So uh, thank you so much for coming again. I want to thank you for coming, of course. I want to thank the speakers for taking the time to doing uh, this tonight. Thank you so much for, for doing it. I want to thank our sponsors, Workbench. Uh, if you have, do you know what Workbench is? Has anybody been here before? No? Well, work, Workbench is incubator, venture fund for technology companies, and they have been extremely, extremely, um, uh, you know, nice with us and with a lot of other people, letting us running these events and building this community here. So I'm super thankful for uh, uh, with Workbench and with our other sponsors as well, SquarePeg and HR One Systems uh, Workbench. So you know, it's been. Uh, Fantastic to have you, and I am really up, you know, thankful for that. There are a um, couple of notes here, and before kicking this formally um, off with Jill, uh, I just want to tell you what we're doing with this Hacking HR global community that, that we're building. I myself, I am a firm believer that the kind of problems that we're dealing with in our organizations today are extremely, extremely complex to be solved by a single HR person, by a single HR function, or by a single company anywhere in the world. So I have spoken with people from all over the world in, the, in HR, and whenever I talk to one of them, they say, yes, we're dealing with you know, this talent war, and we're dealing with technology problems, and we're trying to humanize the workplace. So all, everybody's dealing with the same kind of issues. So the question is, why don't we get together to try to solve some of these problems? Why don't we start building a real global community, not just a group that sends you emails to, you know, for you to participate in their stuff. It's building a real community where we can get together to solve these common problems that we have. Probably Dennis will be touching a little bit on this, but according to a recent um, research by McKinsey, between 375 and 800 million jobs will be lost to automation over the next 10 years. That is not a problem that people in New York will be able to solve. That is not a problem that people in the United States will be able to solve alone. So we got to get together to solve these complex problems that pertain to people, to technology, to the workplace, and, and to life in general. And that's what we are doing with the Hacking HR global community that we're building. It, it, it all started as an event, the Hacking HR forum that we did 13 months ago in DC. That was the first event. And it's grown ever since to uh, we're creating chapters in uh, Right now, we are in 50 cities, 20 countries around the world. Next year, we're hoping to go to 200 cities in every continent. A uh, couple of weeks ago, we had the first Hacking Nature Forum in Lagos, Nigeria. And a month ago, we had the first uh, two Hacking Nature Forums in Europe, one in Zurich, one in London. Uh, I, I don't even know if it was yesterday or today, but for them, it's different in Melbourne, Australia. We have the first Hacking Nature chapter meetup with about 100 people in there. So what we're doing is building community. It's not just doing an event, it's building community. And I want to invite you to be part of this community. How you can get engaged with the community, you can go to the Slack channel and start, start talking to people from all over the world. You can join the Hacking HR at New, York chapter, at New York chapter with Ashley, who is somewhere, where's Ashley? Ashley, where are you? Yeah, Ashley back there, hello Ashley. She's part of the Hacking HR New York chapter. Ali Dalipi, where's Ali? Right yep, he's back there. Uh, he's the bubbly guy back there, um, Ali and uh, Anne Lostig, that she couldn't come. So join them as well in these conversations. And if not, just honestly what we are trying to incentivize people to do in the Hacking HR community is 
Come here and do whatever you want. Create something within the Hacking HR community, whatever it is, but build community and inform the community of all these things that are happening at the intersection of future of work, technology, and HR. That's what we're doing. We are going to continue to do this, and I hope that the way we deliver these, these, uh, these events, the way we build this community is helpful to you to use these tools, this knowledge to, to get inspired tonight and, uh, and whatnot. So that's, that's what we're doing with this Hacking HR community. If you know anybody in other cities who may be interested, please let us know. We're going to be creating the chapters in Dakar and Accra probably early next year. You know, two other chapters in Africa. So it is exciting, honestly, you know, to be able to bring you all together and not only that, we're going to be Facebook uh, broadcasting this on Facebook Live to our global community. So this is amazing that we can do this thanks to technology, but because we're human beings and we're putting the human first in having these conversations. So thank you so much for coming in the snow. And without further ado, where is Jill Katz? Jill, where are you? There you are. Come here, girl. Please help me welcome Jill Katz, CHRO. I'm founder of HR Assemble, so I'm really happy to have you here again. Jill moderated the event that we had in June here in this same place, and you know I had a blast with you. So thank you so much for coming. Turning it over to you. Thank you. Hello. Hello. Dashing through the snow <laughs> in a one-horse open sleigh. Hi, Dennis. I'm Jill. Hello, Jill. Nice to meet you. The rest of us had a call, but Dennis and I didn't get to meet, so I wanted you all to get to see that. That was authentic. It's one of our big words. Welcome to Hacking HR, New York City! We love that you are here. So, uh, my name is Jill Katz. I am the founder and chief change and transformation officer at Assemble Human Resources. Um, I spent uh, about 22 years leading human resources in some large organizations, Calvin Klein, Macy's, um, USA Interactive, a couple other companies, which is incredible because yesterday was my birthday and I turned 27. Um, and so if you are good at math, you can see that I was in fact a child prodigy, um, but it is what it is. Um, there is also a pretty competitive side to me, and so I was pretty angry this morning when I saw the weather, because if you know Enrique, he is the human energizer, Benny. Where is that man? Enrique? He's probably in another state right now, starting another hacking HR as we speak. Um, but this event happens now in a period of 13 months. Hacking HR has spread virally and is in how many cities? 50 billion cities, he said. Um, but this, this is New York, right? And like I said, I'm a New Yorker. I'm a little competitive. I saw the snow and I thought, uh-uh. It's not going to stop us, right? We sold 170 tickets, and as you can see, 710 people showed up tonight. So thank you for being here. I am so excited. I am joined tonight by some of the greatest colleagues in the business, and you are so lucky to be here and to get to hear from them. I'm also so lucky tonight to be able to introduce to you two of the finest women that are here co-representing one of the most exciting organizations that launched last night in New York City. Um, it's called Luminary, so I'm gonna ask Kate Luzio and Serbi Lal to stand up. Uh, Kate, for those of you who follow us um, on LinkedIn, Kate Luzio over here, the one in this gorgeous blue velvet, standing next to the one in the gorgeous pink. We like to look at outfits in New York also, let's not lie. Um, Kate founded Luminary. It opened last night in New York City. And Luminary is a collaboration hub for women. And it is the first of its kind here in New York City where women are going to grow, develop, and invest in one another. And we are working together and we are so excited to be doing work together and Enrique and Kate and I have all talked together about how Hacking HR and human resources people should all know the people at Luminary because spending time being together, investing in one another and growing careers is what this is all about. And the more time you spend introducing yourself to people that you don't know, the more you will build your careers. So coming to places like Hacking HR and looking into organizations like Luminary and others, tonight you could be sitting next to your future boss or your future mentee. 
So thank you, Luminary. Welcome. So glad to have you tonight. Thank you, Enrique. And now I have the best job and the worst job tonight. The best job because I get to show up over and over and you get to clap for me, which is amazing. Um, and I didn't even have to prepare a deck. The worst job because I have to introduce my colleagues and I also am the one that has to give them the hook. So this is like short talks that each get eight minutes and what we'll do is give them tremendous support, and in the end, after each talk, I will lead a panel. What I'd like you to do is write down all your questions. I will judge you to see how smart you are. Okay, I'll give everyone a score, generally, publicly, um, and compare you to one another. No, I won't, just kidding. Look at the faces, there's no judgment. Maybe a little. Um, okay, so our very first speaker tonight is the amazing, amazing Jackie Jenkins, who is the Chief Impact and Strategy Officer at the United Way of New York City. And I'm gonna tell you a little bit about Jackie. Jackie is a philanthropy executive and change leader who spends her time working across sectors to support the most vulnerable populations in the United States. She has helped to transform the hearts, minds, and habits of purposeful people in progressive places like the Coalition of Essential Schools, the New School University, and now at the United Way of New York City. A teacher at her core, and she told us about that on her call. Her gift is inspiring people to act with boldness and humility on their journeys to change themselves, their teams, their organizations, and their communities in a complex and inequitable world. Welcome, Jackie. Thank you so much. It's such an honor, Enrique. Thank you for inviting me here tonight. Um, so the topic today is the intersection of people, culture, tech, and the future of work. And the title of my talk is the future of work, but for whom? And that's the provocative question I really wanna to bring to this conversation tonight. So I'll tell you a little story. Um, as you heard from Jill, I am not in HR. I did not start my career in HR. I'm a teacher at my core. And about two and a half years ago, I decided I really wanted to expand my networks. I spent my life doing change and transformation work, first in classrooms, teaching high school students in urban communities. Then I went on to do school design, opening progressive schools in the San Francisco Bay Area as a part of an activist movement um, called the Small Schools Movement. And then I went on to the university to do teacher leadership development work, coaching teachers to be change leaders in their schools, to bring action research to their work. And now I'm at United Way doing that across sectors um, real systems change work around low-income New Yorkers. So I left United Way a few and a half years ago because I really wanted to accelerate my impact and expand my work. I really wanted to become a tri-sector athlete and work with those in the corporate sector who were talking about issues around change and organizational design that were really, really exciting to me. And I went into these spaces, I was so excited and so serious about it, I somehow even ended up in a few interviews at small boutique consultancies, right, who I thought were my tribe, we had shared values, we had shared vision. And what I realized was that it was a super duper love fest, yet they couldn't really see me. I didn't really feel like I fit or belong. When they saw my resume, they saw my background. We were talking about change and transformation. I'd done org design work, but they really couldn't, we were speaking different languages, right? We had different frameworks. They were like, oh, have you been in the corporate space? Oh, we're not really sure, right? And so I ultimately felt like I didn't belong and I made it my business to become a part of the future of work community, to learn, to try to really bridge boundaries and cross bridges. And it made me really disconcerted and unhappy because I'm saying if we're here to talk about the future of work, I know that it is diverse. I know that there are many, many people with many social identities, with a lot of cognitive diversity, with a lot of backgrounds that need to come together, very much like Enrique said. We are not gonna solve these complex challenges by staying in our silos and not knowing how to cross cultural boundaries, right? At leaps and bounds. And I wonder, was it me? I have several advanced degrees, so, and United Way, we collect data on this. We actually look at wage gaps 
in New York City across various social identities. And what you will see when you look at that data is that even if you are a woman and a woman of color with an advanced degree, that you still suffer from income inadequacy, sometimes with white males who are less formally educated than you are. So having a degree is a part of the way, but it doesn't really get you there. And so what I want to talk about is really a messy concept, culture. A lot of us study organizational culture, but I really feel like we need to get really more complex about this. If you do OA culture or culture work, I recommend to you that you go and my background is in social theory and cultural anthropology. So I read Clifford Geertz, The Interpretation of Cultures. We really need to figure out how do people, right, create cultures? How do we make them? How do we unmake them? We should talk about an even messier concept, which is social identity. Social identity is very, very complex. I was just at an event last night um, on systemic gaps to inclusion in the workplace with Culture Amp. Nobel, the small boutique consultancy, just re-embraced this idea of culture and social identity. And when we looked at the data at Culture Amp last night, we saw that at every measure, when you ask people of different backgrounds and social identities whether or not they feel like they belong at work, they say that they don't. More straight white men feel like they belong in the workplace. When you ask people of color whether or not they have, feel like they have a voice, whether they feel like they're involved in decision making, whether it feels like there is fairness at work, even if they're as visible representational diversity, they do not feel that they are represented. So if you have a problem with belonging in your workplaces, then social identity is a concept that you really need to understand. There's an even messier concept. We're very comfortable in the workplace talking about things that are on the table. But what about those things that are under the table that people aren't talking about and above the clouds? Robert Marshak is one of my favorite, favorite scholars in thinking about covert processes at work. And if you haven't read his work, it's amazing because he lets you know and he helps you to understand that there's a lot going on in hidden dynamics at work. That if you aren't talking about them, if you can't say um, with, with, with confidence, right, and surety, that you can manage those hidden dynamics in a diverse group of people sitting around the table, then there's more work to do as we build the future of work together. My assignment to you as I leave and finish this talk, because I left academia several years ago with all of my degrees because I felt like I wanted to make change faster and better in the world. And so I felt like the place to be was in the world, with people, in organizations, in schools, in institutions. And now I'm back this year at school with scholars because I really do feel that we need to disrupt and deconstruct the scholar practitioner divide. I want you to join me on a learning journey over the next few years as I really go back and I say, why is this happening? How can we marry research with practice to better understand how we can create more diverse and inclusive workplaces? Intercultural competence, the ability to not only understand, but to be able to adapt your behavior is very, very powerful. And what I love about this assessment, because it is an assessment, and I know assessments get a bad rap, I like assessments, the teacher and me, because you can actually see where am I in relation to where I could be, right? If you don't really know where you are when it comes to being able to understand and adapt your behavior in relation to others who are different from you, then you can't know how to improve and how to get better at it. So I leave you by saying, the future of work is not mine, it's not yours, but it is ours. And I really invite a collective problem solving around this work, right? The future of work is very, very diverse. Culture Amp reminded us last night, it is very, very intersectional, right? If you're a woman and a black woman and a trans black woman, right? Then you are less likely to feel like you belong. But what I leave you with tonight is saying, the future of work is interdisciplinary, and I think that Enrique, we did not plan this, but that is basically how he opened this talk. We are not gonna solve these problems if you stay in your silos, if you're reading the business text, or the trade papers or white papers at a consulting agency, if you're not studying anthropology, sociology, racial theory, social theory, right? If you're not understanding all of these things and bringing them to this change, then we will be in the same place 10 years from now. 
And so thank you, and I look forward to collaborating and bridging build building bridges with you. That was perfect. She had six seconds to go. I mean, give her another round of applause. That was unbelievable. Excellent. <clears throat> and some really good challenging questions. So I hope some people wrote some things down and saved them for the panel. Um, our next speaker is a dear friend of mine. That is you. That is you, but I get to read about you first. <clears throat> Claude Silver. It's one of her first nights out in her new life. So I'm so, so excited to announce and introduce my dear friend, Claude Silver, the Chief Heart Officer at Vayner Media. As Vayner Media's first Chief Heart Officer, Claude unlocks employees' potential by forging human-to-human -human connection, creating cultures of belonging, empowering teams to be purpose-driven, efficient, and strong, and infusing the agency with empathy, humanity, and joy. Claude's unique perspective on servant leadership and team building comes both from her training in positive psychology and her experience in talent management, leadership development, coaching, workplace culture, and people operations for over 800 employees across VaynerX. She also founded and ran an outdoor adventure and surf company in San Francisco. I didn't ever do that. <clears throat> Where she was in the cold Pacific Ocean coaching for 250 days a year. <clears throat> I'm happy. Yeah. Really good tan. Wow. Prior to Vayner, Claude held leadership positions at Publicis London, J. Walter Thompson, London and San Francisco, and Organic San Francisco. She and her partner live in New York City, where they are new mommies, to their gorgeous new daughter, Shalom. Please welcome Claude. Hi, everyone. Thank you. You cannot see the rhinestones on Jill's heels, but I can. <laughs> and they are magical. Um, I'm happy to be here. I, uh, I do have a little bit of mommy brain. I now know what that means. So I have so much more empathy for, uh, for people that I work with and, uh, and for moms, quite frankly. Um, I don't know if there's a clicker, but um, thanks. I don't even know if I'm going to use these slides because Really, what I want to talk about when it comes to the future of workplace is uh, how we make people feel. And I still think that is as relevant yesterday as it is today as it will be in the future. So let's see if I can operate this. Great. So I love this, uh, this stanza that Maya Angelou, the late great Maya Angelou wrote. I have it in two places in my office. It's just that important to me. You can tell which part is very important to me because I have bolded that in purple. For me, uh, the alpha and the omega of every single thing that we do in life, and work is part of life, is how we make people feel. I didn't come from an HR background. I came from a long legacy of agencies where I was a, a strategist, so a human behavior, gathered insights on people, studied, studied human behavior. But that doesn't even matter because uh, what, what fundamentally matters is, it doesn't matter that I'm not in HR, let me put it that way, because I have some incredible people around me that have, that have uh, a very deep science, HR science and traditional HR. But what I do have, and I'm not quite sure how it came to me other than, um, I don't know, bolt of lightning, is I understand the importance of making people feel better when they leave me than they did prior period, and that really is a mic drop. How we make people feel is the most important thing, I think, in life, as leaders, as people, as managers. I'm gonna skip ahead real quickly to, oh no, it's just this one, uh, to this other slide I have here. Um, I, I really see things as um, a very flat. I don't see things in hierarchical formats, unless we're talking about Maslow's hierarchy of needs. For me, things are very, very flat. I see leadership as a choice. I do not see it as a rank. I do not see leadership as authority. These are my principles. They're not everyone's principles. 
But when I put these principles on myself and when I help and coach people to put these principles or some manifestation of these principles that they own on themselves, the empathy comes out from, it's like a well, it just comes out from under them and they are able to see people as themselves and see people as equal and see people uh, uh, for their differences and uh, their otherness. One of the things Jackie was talking about that you didn't say the word, but otherness. It is an epidemic right now, uh, more than ever. We're, we, everyone, everyone in this room feels other in some way, shape or form. I feel other because I'm an ambivert and I don't really, uh, I'm not a great networker and I really have a hard time making small talk. That's a way I feel other. I'm gay, that's another way I feel other. But that doesn't matter because I already feel equal and same with you for whatever reason. I know that I'm much older than you, but we probably have certain similarities. I know that I'm different than you and we probably have certain similarities or have gone through certain things. When you take away this idea of being holier than thou, being better than, being more educated, being white, being this, being that, and see each other for who we are as human beings doing the damn best that we can every single day, I think things get a lot more inclusive and a lot kinder and a lot com more compassionate. And uh, by the way, a lot more tender. And I fundamentally think we need a revolution of tenderness in this world. I do. And I think that I would imagine that everyone in this room would raise their hand or else you wouldn't be here. This is hacking HR. Human resources needs to be rebranded, in my opinion. Again, I don't come from HR, and I really, really value those of you that do. I come at it from knowing that people used to tell me, you are an HR person's uh, dream. And I was like, okay, what does that mean? I just don't, I, I don't razz anyone, whatever. Like, you don't know what I do. Uh, but the, the fact is, is that uh, I do think HR needs to be branded. I think as we put things on, as we... Uh, put more empathy into the water of where we work, we become um, kinder people, and I think that we can see people uh, for who they are and for the experiences that they've had before they walk in that door and that the experiences that we give them while they're in the door. So going on, um, I think that leaders look after each other, uh, leaders take risk, you are the one that goes into the fire. As Simon Sinek says, leaders eat last. I fundamentally believe in that as well. Again, these are my thoughts, but it is the, it's, the, it's not even the cap I put on every single day, it is who I am. Uh, the other slide I just wanted to share here is something that, uh, when we talk about empathy is, you know how we say emotions are contagious? And they are, they fundamentally are. As a leader, as a person, as an HR person, the way that you see people is the way that others will see them too. HR has uh, been thought of as the police force in many, many ways. As we rebrand HR in this new world, we have the opportunity to become coaches. That is something that I think is really has been missing and that is something that I, I feel that we have a surge of momentum coming out of this world of HR where people want to be helpful, not hurtful, not on the off, not on the defense, not no. But in the, uh, we wanna be in the business of yes, or yes and. So the way that we see people is the way that other people will see people. That is a huge responsibility on our shoulder. So going back to the late great Maya Angelou's quote, people will never forget how you made them feel. And fundamentally, I do believe that that is our job yesterday, today, and tomorrow as we move into this new world of HR. So thank you very much for having me. And it is true that if you interact with my friend Claude, you will feel better after you interact with her. As a matter of fact, I went back and took a second look at my shoes. <laughs> and if you didn't get to see them, excuse me just a second. <laughs> They're pretty fabulous, right? Okay, the next one up, Mr. Mike Vacanti. Mike, the CEO, advisor, and author of I Am Team. Mike inspires people and companies to reach new levels of possibility through performance, leadership, and culture transformation. 
For decades, he thoughtfully led organizations through mergers and acquisitions, catapulted morale, helped people discover their potential, embrace a growth mindset, and deliver results through significant change and growth. One of his Fortune 100 clients said, Mike is a master at helping people become their best. He listens and solves big challenges. A Microsoft client said, Mike brought his creativity, strategic innovation, and M&A experience as a key contributor to the intelligent cloud leadership as we re-envisioned the future for AI, IoT, analytics, and Azure cloud consumption during our significant reorganization in 2018. And Mike is also one of the founding fathers of the Humans First Club, which is a growing movement focused on bringing people-focused management back to the forefront of businesses. Mr. Vacanti. I'm really happy to be here because I'm not an HR person. <laughs> but I do believe very much in this movement and this time. So leading through transformation, we have to talk about leadership. We have to talk about transformation, get quick definitions around that, and then put it in the context of HR and why now. It's a it's a point of passion for me. So first of all, leadership, we can read volumes, right? There's 8,500 titles out there right now on leadership and it goes back for centuries. We don't have a hard time discovering a definition of leadership. I want to talk about it today in the active sense. And for me, it's two simple words, lift others. It's important to have, no matter what your definition is, it's important to know that it is not a title it is not a position, it is action. And it requires unusual strength when you're going into transformation. And while we can have any definition we like of leadership, I think most of us will know you can't really define it until you experience it. Until you've been with and experienced a great leader, you know what it is, you can read forever and not know what it is. So, Leading through transformation takes tremendous strength, and when we have leaders, we know their true leadership when they've been stress tested. There's no greater stress test than to go through a transformation. What is transformation? I'll keep that really simple. Taking something that exists and making it something else. Clear definition, and we'll use that for, for the talk. Over the last hundred years, we've become amazing at building systems, best practices, operations, processes to adjust and analyze any change that would happen. So, like a Rubik's Cube, going the wrong way, no matter what changes take place, right? It can be one simple turn, we can get it back to solid state. It can be many turns, that are more complex, takes more time, but we've put patterns in place, we've put processes in place that can always get us back to a level of comfort. Something we know, something we can hold, something we can reform, and it's tangible. Transformation is very different than that. So now imagine that you take every piece of this cube and dismantle it. Can you catch this? That is gone. What we know in the past to be solid state, all the work we've done to build things back into the comfort zone, into the known, into normal, which I don't believe actually exists, but our sense of normal is something we strive for. When all those pieces are broken up and you throw them up in the air, it's like an explosion, right? And what's going to happen is it will not get put back together the way it was before. That's transformation. When we look at what's coming for us next, many will say there is a storm coming. Others, I would agree with, say we are in a storm. 
the changes coming at us now are more significant than what we've seen in the last 50 years. The analysts will say that we'll see greater change over the next 10 years than we have seen in the last 50 years. There's other numbers that are important. I'll hit a little bit. But mostly, I want to talk about perspective. And as we go through transformation, if we're not going to get back to the same solid state we were in, that gives HR the greatest opportunity now to have an impact. I believe this very time right now is the greatest time of need and opportunity for HR. And it has to be embraced and it can't be conquered, taken, that leadership is going to be elusive if we search for the Rubik's Cube and we want to put everything back together. My experiences have shown that, going through those transformations, Jill mentioned those, right? So you get brought in, you change things, you, you move things forward in a disruptive state, and then once things are working out pretty well, somebody that's a disruptor gets called in and said, we would now like it to be normal. Well, guess who's not normal? The person that did the <laughs> transformation. So that is a different skill, and I want to encourage that we embrace that, because normal state is not necessarily where we want to get to. Perspectives change. So if we look at the bottom right corner, there is the eye of the storm. The, the storm, the changes we're going to see look different from in the eye of the storm than out on the fringes. It looks different from this aerial view, right? Kind of actually cool. Underneath, a lot of bad stuff's happening. It's tough. It's tragic. In the center, where the executive committee sits, where we make decisions that have ramifications out to the wider circle, we don't necessarily have the perspective of what's happening underneath and what's happening out on the margin. Jackie talked about perspective. Claude talked about perspective. It becomes very difficult to get out of where we are and, and take a look at what the opportunity is. It takes a shift of mindset. And I have to wonder if we're prepared to do that. The, when we enter the technology explosions that are coming, the disruptive business models that are taking place, we have four generations of people working together for the first time, and we're learning that everybody is important, that people that have been on the margins are very important to our business, that learning and having empathy and bringing everybody in to a belief system rather than a leadership system, which is top down and it's hierarchical and it is more controlling. A belief system says I can keep my head up and my eyes forward and I'm going to go another direction. I'm going to end up a place that doesn't exist today, transformation. When we look at the technology available to us, if we apply it to the old patterns, we're going to fail. And we're good at failing when we try transformations. The middle number up here is 84% um, of digital transformations fail. $1.3 trillion spent. We spend a billion dollars a year on employee engagement and we've lost the hearts and minds of our employee. What we stop doing is as important as what we do next. And to get there, we have to reach out and embrace every one of our people. We have to meet them where they are. We have to be able to carry their burdens and their pains. Paint. Ready? Because leadership and transformation sound like pretty words. They're not. Leading through transformation, you have to be able to embrace people where they are, meet them where they are, take on their pain, wear their burden, and let them excel and exceed. And it's unusual strength, and we don't see it very often. But if you can't lead in that manner, and you are going through this transformational time, you have to step out of the way and bring somebody in that can accomplish that. 
grow strong, be wise, lift others, and thank you for being here today. How often do you see a man get painted on in public? That was bold. Awesome. Thank you, Mike. That was great. Our next speaker is Rita King. Oh, there's Rita. I thought we lost you. Okay. Rita King is the co-director and EVP for business development at Science House. Rita designs dynamic plans for the development of collaborative culture. She works with senior leadership teams around the world to align values with business goals and advise on clear actions that trend toward the desired future state. She has served as innovator in residence at IBM and futurist at NASA Langley's think tank. Rita is currently a futurist at the Science and Entertainment Exchange of the National Academy of Sciences, for which she invents technologies, novel characters, and story architecture. Rita is a LinkedIn influencer with over half a million followers. Features by her or about her work have appeared globally. Rita is the creator of The Imagination Age, a way to navigate between the industrial era, which is fading but not gone, and the intelligence era, which is coming but not here. Welcome, Rita. Thank you so much. Um, I am the co-director of Science House here in Manhattan, and I have James Jorash with me. He is the uh, founder of Science House. And at Science House, we like to say that uh, James makes fun things complicated, and I make complicated things fun. And that's true, and that's partly why you're all here tonight as well. So um, I started my career as an investigative reporter. And I specialize in complex systems, so I investigate things like the relationship between corporations and the government, the nuclear industry. I love a very uh, sticky problem with a lot of pieces that's almost unsolvable and then figuring it out. And guess what the hardest problem is? People. People. <laughs> okay? It's people. Um, and that's why we have to worry about automation, because if we were awesome at our jobs, we wouldn't need it so badly, right? So um, what I noticed, um, I was a journalist until 2006, and then IBM actually hired me as a consultant to come in and help them figure out um, the business value of how they were using the internet. It was a very interesting project. I got to create virtual avatars in about a do dozen different platforms, so it got a lot of attention because Picture me, but now picture avatar me that's a little bit better, a little bit taller, higher cheekbones, whatever. Um, still dressed really formally for meetings, even in Second Life, but that's neither here nor there. Um, but what I noticed, because that project got a lot of attention, other companies started coming to me and asking me to help them figure out the business value of how they were using technology. And I noticed that across industries, they all had the same problem, which is they were industrial era companies. Right? Trained in the industrial era, all of us were educated to industrial era thinking. And the thing about the industrial era is it's very tangible. Our brains can make perfect sense of our work products in the industrial era. Looms, engines, cars, they worked or they didn't work. They didn't work, we fix them. Uh, what is the mitigating factor of the industrial era? How fast can people move to assemble something? We've reached the limits of human speed. And my experience working with HR at many different companies is we still think we can just get people to work a little faster and keep them in meetings all day. And then they work at night and on the weekends. And we're going to talk about that in a minute. So industrial era, easy to make sense of. When you were at work, you were at work, you punched in and you knew you were home, you knew you were in the office. Your boss couldn't say, can you hop in and put a couple more cars together? Because you didn't have a conveyor belt at home, like this phone that we have in our pockets all the time. By contrast, we are moving into the intelligence era. Does anybody know what any of these things are on the board in front of you? Now, I just gave a talk at a college, and I had a kid who knew that that was the Schrodinger's equation right there. I'm not going to get into that today, but the point that I want to, well, I will tell you one thing. This is uh, the first computer virus, and the guy who made it was so proud of himself that he put his name and address and phone number in there. 
duh. Okay, we wouldn't do that today, would we? Anyway, this is a cancer genome map. This is the flash crash. We don't even know if humans or machines were responsible for this flash crash. 2011? All right, 2011. Okay, some of us don't even know what year it happened in, okay? Um, the reality is, though, intelligence era work products are nebulous. They are extremely difficult for our brains to make sense of, okay? So if you were at work and you were putting cars together, you knew your job was to put cars together. If you're at work and your job is to create algorithms that, I don't know, maybe destroy democracy or maybe let you connect with your cousins on Facebook, I don't know. But it's much harder to make sense of the ethics. It's much harder to make sense of everything. So we're working faster and faster and harder and harder. And we're spending more time doing what? Meeting with each other. We are in meetings constantly because things are so complicated. And we, instead of stopping and pausing and thinking, we're just rushing around trying to talk until we understand what's going on. So at Science House, James is an inventor named on about 750 patents across industries, including some of the patents at the core of Priceline, and also helped to bring it to market. And a lot of our clients are saying, uh, you know, we would love for you to come in and do some innovation. And we're like, great, that sounds really great. We'll come in and do some innovation. Meeting after meeting after meeting after meeting. For fun, we started actually looking at meetings and saying to ourselves, can we help with this problem? Because it's a huge problem. These people are just meeting way too often. So anyway, long story short here, industrial era, intelligence era, I created a period in between called the imagination age. And I'm not going to get too much into it tonight, just in the interest of time. But you know, when people talk about artificial intelligence, AI, I don't believe artificial intelligence is artificial. I believe instead I call AI applied imagination and it's a skill that I teach to my clients and collaborators and pretty much anyone who will listen, but I'm not gonna get too far down the rabbit hole tonight, but it's just a different way of thinking about how do you get between this tangible era and this nebulous era, using your imagination and collaborating with each other to do it. So we create a system at Science House called Model Meetings. I'm not gonna get um, too into it tonight, uh, but to help with meetings. And also, it mimics a cycle of entrepreneurship, so it teaches our clients to act like entrepreneurs. So learning, innovation, commitment, and alignment, those are the four meeting types. Meetings are more necessary than ever. We're not gonna come in and say, oh, your meetings should be 50 minutes instead of 60 minutes. That'll solve your problem. It will not solve your problem, right? Your problem is way more complicated than that. So it's about bringing focus, clarity, and purpose. And so, it's just pragmatic, right? We believe that the problems that we face are extremely complicated, and the way to solve them is to stop and take a breath and apply innovation to the way humans interact with each other. Um, I'll leave you with this. Animals, they behave differently. How many of you, your meetings feel the same? You're in a meeting. You're just in a meeting, right? You know, if you're brainstorming, it feels the same as a status update. Right? If you're all sitting around talking about this, it feels the same no matter what. But animals are very different, right? So I'll leave you with this a little pragmatic thing you can take back with you to your job. Um, what happens if you uh, walk a bird? Does the bird love it the way a dog does? No, guys. The bird will fly away. You will lose that bird. What if you feed uh, uh, goldfish food to your dog? Dog doesn't like it. Right? So if you are in an innovation session, coming up with ideas, and HR or legal are sitting there listening to ideas, going back to yes and we talked about earlier, they're not like, that sounds great. They're like, no, you can't do that because, or you can't do that, it's illegal. Okay, we can figure that out later, right? After we've come up with ideas. So we're looking for pragmatic ways to make it easier for humans to interact with each other. And I'll just leave you with this. What is the purpose of what you're trying to accomplish? If you always start with your purpose and work backward, you are much likelier to achieve your purpose. Whereas if you don't start with your purpose, you will end up somewhere, but it may not be where you want to end up. Thank you for having me. Great. You're going to get a lot of good questions. I'm looking forward to the panel questions because I've sat in about 
In my 22 years, I think I spent 17 of them in meetings. And so I'm looking forward to hearing more from Rita on that topic. Um, our last speaker tonight is Dennis Mortensen, the founder of XAI. So Dennis is the CEO and co-founder of XAI. Dennis is an expert in leveraging data to solve enterprise use cases and a serial entrepreneur who has successfully exited several companies on that theme. His long-term vision of killing the inbox. Thank you, Dennis. Thank you for that. I hope it works, of killing the inbox led to the formation of XAI and the creation of Amy and Andrew, artificially intelligent assistants who schedule meetings. He speaks frequently to anyone who will listen, from crowds of Web Summit to his building's doorman, about an optimistic future for AI, productivity, and the future of work. Dennis was also an accredited associate analytics instructor at the University of British Columbia and the author of Data Driven Insights on collecting and analyzing digital data. Originally from Denmark and keeping his accent, Dennis is now a New Yorker for life. <laughs> Welcome, Dennis. Thank you very much. That's the accent. I'm obviously not from here. Uh, spent the last 10 years here. And yeah, I'll give you that story. So we sold our prior, prior company to Yahoo, which is how I ended up over here. And I negotiated hard on that whole idea of moving out to the valley, because we spent four years in Budapest doing that venture. And they wouldn't have it. Nine hours in between Budapest and uh, Sunnyvale just wouldn't really fly. And I thought I'd just spend, you know, a quick one year in New York, and then just leave. That was 10 years ago. And I think what I'm afraid of the most is I'll never leave now. Now, I'm going to be uh, super tactical. So the title of the event tonight, suddenly as you signed up, said Hacking HR and the Future of Work. And I'm going to be speaking to that exactly. But before I do that, I, I got an animal story as well. So if you want to toughen up your kids on entrepreneurship, given my dad was also an entrepreneur, he brought home eel one night. You can bring home live eel. And uh, eel are like kind of sharks in that their teeth kind of go in the opposite way. He paid me $2 if I was willing to put my finger into the mouth of an eel, knowing that that would kind of clam up and you can't pull your finger out. And you can see an eight-year-old run around the house with an eel in his finger until he figures out, how do you then solve that to kind of get that off? Do you kill it? That seems like not right when you're eight. But how the hell do I get the eel off my finger now? And you just kind of just squeeze it on the side, and that's how you get it out. I obviously remember it now uh, 33 years later, and I'm still scarred by it. <laughs> now, um, <laughs> I will find revenge, revenge one day, but we'll figure that out. So on hacking HR, I think there's this somewhat honest statement, if we're really kind of true to each other, for where if we go look at that inbox and that set of chores that comes along with the inbox, not all of them align to the job function that we might have, whether you're a customer success specialist, an account management, a recruiter, head of the people function, those emails sadly somehow end up just being chores that you have to do to kind of get to the real work behind it. And it's not that I think we can solve all of those chores. I do think though that one of those particular chores in that inbox will be the one of just setting up the next, next meeting which you have. If I could remove that, you'll be slightly happier. Not ecstatic, but just slightly happier. And if I'm really lucky, there'll be like 15 other interesting dudes or good women behind me who will solve the other chores. And somehow we can get back to what we were supposed to do when we were hired. Now, how does that work? And what is the kind of real outcome of that if we are somewhat successful in delivering on that promise? It certainly works in such a way for where if we take the tiny chore of setting up a meeting for where we all immediately know what that means. As in, I don't need five slides to explain to you what that means or what that translates into. As in, you email me saying, hey Dennis, you seem odd, we should meet up for a Diet Coke. 
Do you got time at some point in December? And the only way we can now solve that little uh, conundrum is that I email you back saying, hey, sure, December 4th, no, December 5th, eh, nah. we can do the 6th, sure, morning, yeah, half an hour, my office, I'd be nice if you come to my office. And that ping pong, we all do, and we all do it all the time. Sure, if you're in sales, you do it more, if you're in back-end engineering, but we all do that. Actually, to the tune of about 10 billion some formal meetings being set up in the US alone every year. Now, how can you escape that? It certainly used to be that the only way to escape that was if you won the corporate lottery, right? You become SVP of Flim Flam at Time Inc. and they give you a human, Tom. <laughs> like, I won. We wanna meet up? Yeah, I'm up for that. Tom, you fucking work on it. Uh, <laughs> but that doesn't really remove the chore, right? It just really kind of moves the chore from me to Tom, so the chore still exists. We just figured out that Tom might be slightly cheaper than Dennis. Fair enough, but what if we could remove that chore, as in it just disappears, and it's not a luxury, and you don't have to kind of win that corporate lottery. So we've spent, me and my 100 propeller head friends down on 200 Broadway the last four years in building these two intelligent agents, so that when you do email me, I can reply back and say, yeah, Diet Cokes, screw that, we'll have Red Bulls. But I have also CC'd in Amy, she can help put something on my calendar for half an hour on 200 Broadway, week of December 10th. As I click send, which is just an email address, not an app, not a website, not a destination, really just an address for where, for all intents and purposes, there could be a human behind that email address. Kind of like what we do with most of the employees which we have, we email them little tasks. In this setting though, it's a machine who understands what did Dennis just asked me to do, remove Dennis from the equation, reach out to you and or more participants, negotiate with them in natural language, move it not round circles, but towards a conclusion, and upon conclusion, send out an invite. And again, it's not rocket science, it's just shit I don't wanna deal with. <laughs> and if that can disappear, I'm slightly happier. That sounds super simple. Uh, $40 million later, we're still uh, fucking working on it. So it's not as simple as it sounds, but it's a honest chore to remove. Now, imagine though that not only we succeed, and I think we're on a good path, you should all go sign up for Extra AI tonight at 11 p.m. when you get home. But if we succeed, that suggests there'll be other people succeeding in removing other chores. As in, there's nobody in here who says, you know what I really like doing on Saturday nights? Inputting my receipts to get reimbursed. Four fucking dollars for a bagel. As in, <laughs> no I don't. I just pay for it because I don't want to click the little picture thing and uh, submit it. So forget it. Uh, it's on me, SoftBank. Um, one of our investors. Ah, this is being filmed. Uh, <laughs> I screwed up. Cut. Um, so, so in that setting, if you can imagine us being successful in at least removing the meeting scheduling task, you can also imagine all of the other little chores disappearing. And as you imagine those chores disappearing, what you're really imagining then is that you, in your first job out of college, which must have been like three years ago, <laughs> something like that, yeah, I'm losing already on that. And in that setting, your job might be one of saying, what immediate employees do I need to put on my team? There won't be human, there'll be machines though. I certainly need a meeting scheduling agent, I need the receipt agent, I need the travel agent, I need these seven agents to be able to do this particular job. And it would perhaps even seem odd if you walked into an interview and suggested, or oh, me? No, I just do my own email. No, I do my own segmentation. No, I just do analytics on paper. Not meetings? Yeah, I sit in my underwear at uh, midnight and schedule meetings. What? That seems just not right. And if you do hire that handful of agents, then you're kind of a manager. And if you're a manager, that suggests we now entered some sort of setting for where at 22, you need immediate management skills, but not of other humans, but of other machines. Both, where do you find them? How do you train them? How do you keep them working well? And on the other side, how do you kind of inject humans into that equation as well? That I find interesting. 
That was my very kind of tactical input. Thank you very much. Great. Fantastic. I know what I'm going to sign up for tonight at 11 o'clock. <laughs> that was excellent. All right, well, that concludes our speakers. And so I think the next thing we do is we set up our panel. So we set up our panel. Panelists, come set up the panel. Rita, Mike, Claude. Everyone's good. We've got water. Cheers. Cheers. That was a great. I'll take a water as a thank you. Oh, good. Oh, you did. No, oh. Nope. You do it. Nope. 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 I'm good. Honey, can you get me a water? Thank you. That's my husband. Everyone say hi to Josh. <laughs> right. Right. I'm gonna get a machine to get me water after my husband at some point. That's right. <laughs> All right, well, first of all, those were incredible talks. Thank you all so much for everything you shared tonight. Um, I have to say, sitting and listening to those talks, I actually had a, a moment of just wanting to thank Enrique again and thinking that in the past 13 months, what Enrique Rubio has brought to so many communities is unbelievable that we all get to come here together and listen to so many interesting topics and how much we heard in eight minutes from each of you and how many questions I had and how many interesting things came up, I can only imagine. And I know that last time I moderated, we got through half of the questions in 45 minutes. So I'm gonna try to go as quickly as I can. Um, so who would like to be the first person to ask a question? Right, that's right. All right, so this is my Oprah time. I love this part. Hi, I'm Jill. Andres. Andres, hola. Yeah, hola. Please stand up. Okay, sure. This is Andres. Everyone say hi to Andres. Hi. Awesome. Where are you from? Colombia. Colombia. Where do you work? I work uh, all around. Keep on traveling. I, have a, I work for a startup called Torre. All right, he works for a startup. Tell us a little bit about it. Yeah, so our mission is to make work fulfilling for humanity. So uh, that's the reason why I'm here. Awesome. Um, Thank you. Uh, you will clap more once we get there, so yeah. Uh, so in order to get there, I'm trying to get answers from people like you guys, and uh, I know it's like kind of you are doing the, the job for me, uh, but I really believe when, when humanity, you know, puts in the work and, and uh, helps each other, well, we go faster. So the question for you guys is, what do you think are the key variables for um, managers, companies, humanity in general to consider when matching talent to a fulfilling professional opportunities? The key variables for matching talent to opportunities. Fulfilling. For fulfilling opportunities. Yeah. Oh, they have an answer. I mean, I'm, I'm just going to start because it's an easy answer for me. Kindness, compassion, respect, connection, and uh, trust. But I think it all starts, for me, it all starts with kindness. There's nothing else. People need room to evolve and grow and learn. And when they grow and learn, they need to be constantly able to go to the next stretch goal. And we tend to keep people locked into the same, you know, this is what you do, this is where you are in the org chart, and you know, that's my job, and it discourages growth. Yeah, I'm just gonna hit really quickly. I don't think that job descriptions are written to actually uh, describe the job that needs to be done. So we can put a bunch of skills on, a, on, on paper and, and that doesn't fit. The career isn't necessarily based on passion, but it has to be purposeful. And, and I think what we can do better on the organizational side is focus on measuring growth and maturity rather than skill development. So I'm not an HR, I'm a CS major, and I have a team that works the kind of HR angle, so they kind of keep me in check and I make sure I behave. 
I am personally a huge fan on aligning on the destination. So if you and me go into business together, or you and me and a uh, hundred of our propeller head friends go into business together, we need to agree on where we're headed. And I'm just such a huge fan of if we can at least agree on that, there'll be plenty of other things we'll disagree on on the way there, but at least we're headed to the same place. And I would say underneath all of this and all of this complexity, I think if job descriptions don't matter and things are shifting, um, self-awareness is a really critical skill. And you know what, I would also add to that, having been a head of HR for 22 years, um, I think that we also need to start looking at the person, which is asking people what is fulfilling to them. I think that gone are the days where the company gets to decide what fulfills people. And today it is as important for us to be asking people and candidates what is fulfilling to them and for us to start helping to create roles and putting people in roles where we believe they will be fulfilled as well. So that's a great question. Thank you. Thank you so much. Awesome. Other questions? All right, we're going, we're, we're actually, we're gonna, it looks like we're gonna go like east to west tonight. All right, hi, how are you? I'm Jill. Elisa, how are you? Stand up. This is Elisa, where are you from? Square Peg Hires. That's right. Hi. Um, I have a comment for the first two speakers. Uh, you talked about inclusiveness and the importance of making people feel included. I feel like there's a different angle on the same problem. The future of work is interdisciplinary independently of our efforts to foster inclusiveness. Uh, we've reached a point of saturation in terms of super specialized roles and unavoidably the next step is going to be cross-functional, bridging all that knowledge to make it meaningful. Um, and the people who are best set to do this are the people at those turbul turbulent intersections that we refer to as diversity. Recruiting for diversity is not just a moral imperative, but it simply makes good business sense. We'll always need the people who fit comfortably into existing roles, but we'll also need the ones who have spent the most time bridging those silos. Uh, and that change is coming, whether or not we hire the people best prepared to deal with it. But it just sounds like a good idea. Was, thank you, yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yes is good enough. <laughs> yes. Did you have a question? Well, you've spent a lot of time talking about how important it is to make people feel good and feel included and feel important. But there seems to be like a rational business angle to this as well. And so do you want to yes, talk? Again. Yes. Do you want to talk a little bit about maybe the business pieces to the diversity? Is that what you want to hear more about? In addition to the inc the the emotional imperatives of inclusivity, also what are some of the business impacts? Is that your question? Yeah, it seems like a win-win. Oh, absolutely. The other half of it is not really being addressed. Oh, so th this is a great question. So I think maybe we talk a little bit about what are the very obvious and important business wins that we see when we focus also on inclusivity and diversity. <laughs> That's why they pay me. <laughs> Billions. <laughs> Thank you for the question. Got it. So yes, there are uh, emotional reasons to dive deep and go on all in on diversity and inclusivity. The business reasons are things such as hiring for values, a difference of values, curiosity, Something that we do uh, at VaynerMedia is I changed it from hiring for, uh, hiring for culture fit to skill set fit and culture addition, which allows us to widen the net and look for people for who are obviously different than me or different than our CEO, who have a difference in um, the way they see the world, the way they see people, the way they solve problems. So, and in advertising, and, uh, I mean, I'm in advertising and marketing, it's a win-win completely because we want to have, we do not want apples and apples and apples. We want the entire garden, quite frankly. Um, and I will just add that yes, um, businesses are organizations. 
which exists within an external environment, which is the United States of America, which is a stratified, racialized, <laughs> gender dynamic place, and the population of the United States is changing. So um, if we need people to lead and work in organizations, then we need to adapt um, and make sure that we are ready and your house is in order. I think, Jackie, you said it perfectly. Sometimes I just say it's the, it, we're, we're the microcosm to the macrocosm, and the macrocosm is the world, and it's very diverse. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think that's a great question. I, you know, I spent a, a great amount of my career in retail, and I often used to say it was so important for us from an HR perspective, and you know, Claude talks well about this, to be focusing on diversity inside of our organization for our employees, but it was also so important for us to remember that the people who were buying our products were also our, our employees. And we were making products and we needed to be re remembering that our employees were also our customers who are also our clients. And so if we weren't thinking very diversely, if we weren't remembering that the people who are coming into our stores and buying our products were, were diverse people, and if we weren't thinking that way and if we were having one kind of thought, we were gonna miss our customers too. So there are so many business imperatives um, there's so many reasons to focus on diversity. So that's a great question. Thank you for that. Great question. Thank you, guys. Um, so I'm going to come back over here, and then I'll move to this section. Kate Luzio from Luminary. Welcome. I'm going to use my different, my former life. So brand new entrepreneur, but I spent 20 years as a banker. Uh, just left the banking world a few months ago um, and worked for three of the largest banks in the world. And I want to talk to Rita because I... I understand what you're saying about meetings. I think it's really hard to change a culture in big companies. It's very easy in a startup and a small company because you don't have it ingrained in you that meeting after meeting after meeting. I think it's, it's easy to say it starts from the top, but no offense to anyone and no offense to anyone in HR. A lot of people sit in meetings because they don't want to work. Oh, that's okay. very true. And they don't want to actually, they hide behind the meetings so that they're not caught out yeah. by not working. I mean, you look at Amazon and, and 15 minutes is their max, right? And they have one piece of paper, you can come in. I think it's amazing. And I worked for a very large bank and they tried that and it lasted about three days because people brought in 30 page PowerPoints and it's really hard. So how do you change that culture without just saying, hey, let's no more meetings, because you can do that, but doing it well is a different story. Yeah, great question. Um, that's why I say I like to make uh, complicated things fun, um, because meetings are complicated. So the framework that we created, Model Meetings, is designed to be modular for many reasons, including the reason you just described, which is, I mean, when they start realizing they're actually solving the problem, they sort of freak out a little bit sometimes because what are we supposed to do now that we're not in meetings all day? Meetings, it's busyness instead of business. And as long as my face is at the table, then I'm important because I'm at your party, right? And if I'm not, if you don't see my name in the, in the call or I'm not here, I'm not important and I'm, right. So we took all that into account when we developed the system and we like to say to clients, if you make a 5% improvement, I mean, a company that has, let's say 25,000 employees, um, you know, about people, professionals spend about half their time in meetings, about half of that time is unproductive. We're very clear about the fact that we're only going after the unproductive time, okay? And of the unproductive time, there are some of our clients, if they make a 5% improvement, that could be, uh, you know, some of them are wasting up to a million dollars a day. So the point is, it's, we're chipping away and we're super clear about that from the beginning for the reason you just described and other reasons. So, so my hope is not one for where we um, somehow come up with a slightly tighter process and sell it a little bit harder than yesterday. And I'm like you, sadly, in a setting where I've seen it just tried so many times that I just don't see it play out well tomorrow. I think in my mind, and this is perhaps the delusional entrepreneur, is one for where software somehow needs to arrive here for where you should not be allowed to send an invite if you can't come up with a three bullet agenda. As in, it's just not possible to add it to the agenda. So, 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 we, are, so we are doing exactly that for where I want to add friction to the process for where if you are so empty of thought for where that is something you can't come up with, I'm not so sure we should have a meeting. 
Or if we had a meeting for where you obviously now invested, there were seven people there, so we are 5K down, what was the output or the sort of tasks or the kind of things that we believe should have been the, the kind of agreed upon items? Who's writing that up? We many of us have meet, left kind of meetings where, sure, we kind of half shook hands, but nothing kind of happened. So, so I think software somehow is the answer, and I know that is very kind of geek, entrepreneur, CS major type answer, but I see, I see it kind of happen. I just want to talk to you in tent because we all know what a KPI is, right? Key performance indicator. 90% of those meetings were talking about KPIs, they're actually KPRs. They aren't indicating anything. We sit in meetings and we talk about what already happened and we report that up. It's, it's, it does start with leadership because they have to stop asking for what they're asking for. If we are actually bringing people together to talk about what is next rather than what happened before. So the mindset shift is to empower people rather than have them report in and we know in many of the industries and many of the reasons we have meetings, it's, it's CYA, not KPI. Uh, I'm going to go over here and then I'll come back. Hello. I'm going to come all the way over to you. Watch this. This is Customer Service New York City. Yes, we greet each other. We meet. This is a networking event. I'm Jill. Hi, Margaret. Um, I'd just like to challenge KPI, and maybe I'd like to change it to key power indicator. Because I see, I go into organizations, some of them are rated in New York, best places to work. And um, I came from an HR ops background, I do consulting now. And I go in there, and these places that are the best places to work, yes, there's some great benefits. You get a holiday, you get a nice party, these types of things. But then when you see where the decision making is, and it's siloed, and there's like six little people at the top deciding and controlling the firm, yet they know how to win the awards. I just want to challenge that, and I don't know who could answer this, but it's design, um, maybe some software that not just measures employee morale and things like that, but actually decision making. Um, I'm glad she followed up with the question because I had a comment, which is a just. <laughs> Rita's answering your question with a book. That's pretty good. I'll come back next year. So, Mike talked about leadership and culture. And I think if you walk into an institution and you look at behaviors and you observe them and you sort of feel what's happening there, you have to look at and ask yourself when it comes to changing a system, whether it's an organization or a network. Um, what are the conditions here that are holding the problem in place? And that's where culture analysis, I think, really comes in, where you really have to backward map that and really look at behaviors. Um, I'm not sure if there is a technology you asked about, a survey around decision making. I mentioned Culture Amp and their diversity and inclusion survey where they ask about decision making and they're able to track how, where power lives within a culture when you talk about voice and fairness and decision making. So culture analysis is really, really important before you take action. Um, and that's really why I brought that up as a messy concept that we really need to unpack and we need to be able to better diagnose. Um, I didn't get into it in my talk just for the brevity, but um, Science House is the exclusive North American licensee of a tool called Culture Map that I gave you the book for. Um, and uh, we do have a visual map that we create for organizations. So we'll start with the CEO's team or the CIO or whoever hires us to do it. And we map out their culture and it's visual and it's amazing when you see it. And every single client we have is like, we're gonna go on this side. So it goes from stabilizing to energizing. I'll spare you the details, but the gist is, never had a client come in and wanna be less innovative, for example, or they all wanna be more innovative. But doing it is a whole different situation. And um, you know, you, when you hold up that map and you say, you know, oh, we're going on vacation to the Grand Canyon. Here's a picture of the Grand Canyon. You're like, great, get your donkey or whatever you use to go down to the Grand Canyon because you now have to go get water and food and get down into the Grand Canyon. It's a lot easier to just say you're going to go there. Um, and you know, the map is half of the story. Sorry, this is the last thing I'll say. And I love, because I've done similar mapping with similar tools, 
and what and this is why I brought up the concept of covert processes and hidden dynamic at work and what doesn't get spoken about because you can do all of that work on the table and in the view of everyone and it gets back to your key power indicators and unless you really understand and are able to address because one person with more power in that room could undo all of that work with a, with a comment or a look right and so I, I I left the question with you are you able to really assess and manage and see that and then lead facilitate a dialogue in a room right use yourself as instrument to disrupt that so that you could really get at the root cause of what's happening in a group of people our next question is from this unbelievable person who before you even ask your question please stand up rich cardona this man turn around I want, I want everyone to know this man. This man, Rich Cardona, um, has joined our lives. He is um, a leadership development individual. He is an ex-Marine. Thank you, sir, for your service. And he does such unbelievable work. If you look tomorrow on LinkedIn or anywhere else on social media, you'll see that we all look great. And that is because of Rich. <laughs> that is the power of that camera. Your question, sir? Uh, my question revolves around the job description that we were talking about earlier. This is something I've thought about a million times but never really addressed, but uh, because this isn't is hacking HR. So I think job descriptions are a lot of times just bullshit. Um, and, and I mean, in your case, you need to be very technical for something. If someone wants to work for you, then it's like, it probably needs to be very technical. But I think there's a lot of technicalities and job descriptions that scare people away. And I think there's a lot of companies that say, like, I hire for talent, you know? Like, I, I, I will hire for the talent and the character and maybe they'll learn. But they don't actually do that. So in my opinion, you're scaring a lot of people away because they are avoiding the embarrassing no that's not even from a person but that's probably from a tracking system so because of that uh, my question to whoever wants to take it is like how do we go all the way back to the source which is the job description like Claude could probably say for someone for this position this is what I actually need or Mike could say this is what I actually need not and you know what you always see at the very bottom is excellent verbal communication I got the bottom, and that bothers me incessantly. But uh, that is something that's on my mind. I'd love to hear your thoughts. So here's the hack I applied, and uh, my counsel were laughing their ass off. So it's not necessarily recommended. But uh, <laughs> that's the disclaimer. So you can go on x.ai slash pledge. So the way we certainly hired that first two dozen or so people was not on a set of bullets on, I need you to be an expert in NLP coming out of MIT, having worked at Google for three years, also knowing these particular languages, which we could and can certainly kind of test for, but we wrote this pledge where I tried to describe the journey that we're about to take together, where there's no kind of technical speak in that, and I talk about how I want you to be comfortable in the dark and items such as that for where, if you are a person for where, I think I might thrive in, in some environment where there's a lot of uncertainty, we might not be able to solve it. This could be a good job for you. We'll talk about all your technical skills later. But where my counsel kind of laughed the most was, I actually printed it out. We obviously did all the kind of sign the stock option, sign the kind of offer letter, sign all the other things. And then I put that aside and said, I want you to sign this kind of half page poem I kind of wrote, and I want you to read it and really believe in it. And then Gunderson will come back and say, Dennis, that's not a fucking contract. What are you doing? You're an idiot. No, I actually think that is the very one piece of paper I want them to sign and believe in. So that was a try. I think it's worked very well. First engineer, first PM are still there because we're on this journey together, which was not eight bullets. So I have been involved with staffing companies, right? So at, at some point there's, I mean, tens of millions of dollars of P&L and many recruiters and many companies. So I've seen a lot of job descriptions. I've, I've been in that process. Um, it's necessary to spell out what are the technical skills. And then you're looking at what they call soft skills, right? Um, the shift is more of the technical skills are existing with more people. 
but they're less important. So how do we get the human skills in there? And I don't think we've solved that. I've also been out looking for a job myself, right? And so I look at a job description, it's like, I have all of that. Go in and talk to them. It's like, well, you're an old guy, so forget it. Um, but no, actually, it's, it's you go in and they say, well, Mike, this is an operations role. So we have a 20-year veteran saying, you ran an $84 million P&L with hundreds of people around the world with HR and everything reporting to you, but we don't see how you did operations. Where is that in what you were doing, right? So it's, it's so missing. And you have a 20-year veteran recruiter who's a wonderful person. I met her. We spent time. And now we're talking about applying technology to do facial recognition to keep people out of our companies. So when I talk about where we're going to apply the power of this technology, we have to be very thoughtful and very capable or very careful. Because if we have a 20-year pro veteran that can't determine that I have a skill set to do a job, and now we're going to try to train a machine to pick up on that thing the 20-year veteran couldn't do, we're in big trouble. So be careful about technology. Hopefully that gets a little bit where it's going. I'm going to push back on that. Um, <laughs> so um, she was obviously uh, awful, and we all hate her. So we are on the same page. I actually think that technology is our only hope in that setting for where we just have so many biases for where you're not even aware of the biases that we sit with. And the only way we can kind of train a system is not necessarily by sitting down with that individual woman and tell her what's wrong with her decision making, but in creating some system where we can both test and explore on how to remove these biases. And so I'm the technology, people with biases. <laughs> no, that, so I'm going to call bullshit on that as well. So I'm, so I'm, I'm equally uh, interested in a positive outcome, right? As in, let's make the assumption here that you and me want the same. Agreed. I think the best way to get to that destination it's not through some belief that we find the superhuman who can make a set of decisions that are slightly better than what we were able to do yesterday, but I think it's finding a data set which is so unbiased that we believe it represents a future we want to live in. That, I think, is way more likely than you and me educating those five people over here to be the people we want them to be. I want to mm, that's because, all right, I, I want to push back on that um, for a few reasons, but I'll stick to one. Um, I'm trying to think of the best way to say this. Um, we train people and company, large companies, and I just want to be clear. At Science House, we, work, we have startups. When you run out of cash at a startup, you're done. So, like, you have a different culture because when you run out of cash, you're done. So you have to move. Large companies train people to really do one thing, to play the game. So that because they're narrow pay bands. So what I hear very often is a lot of people who sound like they're talking about the same goal, but really what they're doing is optimizing for their own self-interest and sounding as if they have the same goal and then rationalizing backward about, well, this is why we have to do this because, and then it's because I'm playing the game right now so I can get promoted out of this narrow pay band and be your boss. So the reality is, you know, and a lot of the work I do as an ethicist is around things like robot wars. We're not as smart as we think we are, and it's only hubris that makes us think we are, which I agree with you, technology is inevitable, we're going there, we're going there one way or the other, but we're not prepared intellectually for it, and I, we can't pretend we are. We ha these biases are going to appear, and we don't understand them yet, so we're kind of playing with fire. Even if it's inevitable, we're still playing with fire. I'm going to hold on, I'm going to... Uh, can I say one yes. quick thing? One quick, because I, 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 I do a lot of hiring. Uh, I'm going to let Claude go, and then I'm going to take it out to the crowd because so the I, crowd wants to jump in I too. I can't tell you how many companies reach out to me for psychometric testing when it comes to uh, hiring. And there's one reason, one reason only I don't do that. I don't think it's fair. I think SAT tests suck and I think psych psychometric testing for, thank you, for, uh, I, I just don't, I, I think it's ridiculous to have a non-human interaction and I think that's a bias that is created by a non-human. So, and that's no offense to people that are in tech. It's just, uh, it's just the way it is. So I would rather be able to assess based on the needs I know that we have at an agency, knowing that we're going to, that we enable career architecting to happen, 
human to human rather than put someone in an ENIFJ or F da 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 da. That's a great conversation. So on this, before we move to another topic, we've got to hear from our panel, people who want to discuss this topic or add to this topic in the group. I know this gentleman out here has had his hand up. You've been the best student in the room. My son would never keep his hand up that long. What's your name? Kenny. Kenny, hi. Hi. Um, thank you very much. And I'm looking around the room, and once again, I think I might be the oldest guy here, okay? I just want to say, when it comes to job description and skills and things like this, I really think we need to be focused on the fact that, you know, I've been in, I've been in HR now like 30 years, and I've seen the enemy and it is us. And what I mean by that is this. We consistently ask these, for lack of a better term, kids, for skills and degrees for which they do not need for jobs that we're asking for, that they're going into debt for thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars and student debt is going to, is probably right now is the next big crisis in this country. And, and you're talking to somebody who has no skin in the game. I, fortunately, my wife worked for an organization that had a great tuition benefit. I graduated two kids from private uh, college with no debt. Both of them had their bachelor's degree. So I have no skin in the game. But I see these kids, they're at work, and I'm like, I got all this college debt. I don't know how I'm going to pay it. And I'm like, what the f I, it's, it's, it's amazing to me. And, and now, I, I mean, I've started my own campaign. What I do is that when a new job comes in front of me at work, if it requires anything higher than a high school education, that manager better have a damn good reason as to why. And when I say, how come this job requires a bachelor's degree? Well, eh, no. The answer is no. I don't allow it. Because if it doesn't need it, why are we asking for it? I mean, you know, there's plenty, like, you know, even when it comes down to, like, you know, people that can code and stuff like that, there's a lot of these guys that, that just don't have it, but they can code. So, so what the hell? We, we removed all of ours, every single, there's, there's no requirement to have anything more than a high school education at, at uh, VaynerMedia, because you just don't need it. No. I was, I was asked to... I, I was asked to like ask what company I work for. I work for a community health care network. It's a great organization. We are a safety net health provider. We, um, we provide <laughs> primary care, behavioral health, and care coordination to the underserved populations of Brooklyn, Bronx, Manhattan, and Queens. We serve about 80, 85,000 of our most needy patients in, in those areas. Yeah, that's what we do. Was there anyone else on this topic? I'll come, I'll come here and then I'll come I'll over to you. What's your name, sir? My name is Hi, hi, Hi. Hi. Um, I'm listening to your uh, topics and uh, several times you mentioned about problems of the way technology works to hire people, do the job descriptions, uh, bring human back to, back to work. Um, and idea come to my mind is, is it a problem that we don't use technology the right way? It, because we, instead of trying to use technology to help us do our job better, we kind of push it aside and let technology do it. We don't seem to care how this technology is prepared. So do you think that the problem actually is, actually is with the humans, uh, because we think that we can use technology, but we don't use it, we are trying to outsource it to technology without being actually well prepared. Okay. To no surprise, I'm pro-technology. Um, and I think you're right that it's somewhat naive to believe that you can take a very complex decision process and outsource it to a machine with some basic data set and just believe you're slightly better off because I think many times we are potentially worse off. And I do think there's some symbiosis here in between the kind of man-machine relationship, but I actually do think that leaning, you know, 
up against the machine and trying to solve some of the problems that we've been unable to solve for decades, if not kind of half centuries, now is the moment for where somebody who's not making parole, not getting a credit card, not getting that mortgage, not getting some of these things that are very dramatic decisions for where we know through study after study that we are making extremely biased human decisions that with a little bit of technology, tomorrow could be better. And that's, that's what I'm trying to lean into for where I just don't see that three individuals in that uh, hearing really being optimized so aggressively that tomorrow is going to be so much more brighter. But I do think if we put some guardrails in place backed by technology, tomorrow could be brighter. So I think I may. Oh, you don't agree with me. Something I'm, I'm giving it to him. <laughs> <laughs> and I actually do agree with you, but I'll still give it to him. Stay, stay. No, I was just really quickly going to say I, I jump into that camp really fast because technology done well is a brilliant tool. And um, as Dennis was speaking there about being able to use that technology to um, serve marginalized communities to give people a lift. And I've publicly written, so I'll say it here in front of the group, is I believe the greatest failing of HR through my long career, the gray hair, is learning and development. We just failed at learning and development. The technology that Dennis was just talking about is one of the greatest opportunities because you can input my stuff you can get a good read on me as a machine, and you can also now go out to a database and select a learning path for me that 20 human beings going one-on-one -on -one with me could not do. The greatest opportunity to lift people up with AI right now, I believe, is to solve one of the biggest problems, not to facial recognition to push people out and create more barriers to getting into our companies. I just want to say one quick thing, which is, when I mentioned this earlier, the imagination age, the core idea is it's not artificial. We're not outsourcing anything to machines if we think about it as AI, as applied imagination. We're amplifying our human imagination and using technology where appropriate and where we're capturing value for humans. Obviously, it's inevitable. I'm you know, I'm, I'm not going to argue with that, but I think if we think about it as applied imagination instead of artificial intelligence, we don't think of a hammer as artificial when we're building a house. Why should we think as the algorithms that are helping us get better as humans as artificial? I think that's our error in thinking, and if we can get over that, we would capture a lot more value for humans, and I think we will. There's a, there have been a few more comments. I'm coming over here because I, I feel like this, room, this side of the room hasn't gotten proper love. So, and you were here last time. It's good to see you again. So thank you, thank you for this opportunity, and thank you to be discuss, discussing uh, humanity in the context of human resources. So I'm an HR professional. I've been doing HR my entire life, and that's what I believe I can do well. Um, and as we are talking about it, um, you know, in terms of talking about job description and profiling, you know, and talking about, and, and, and I really want to give credit to Enrique because this is really a global movement, and I've hardly seen in HR business, a global movement. So I come from a developing country, right? And I have worked in, most of the time, in global companies based in developed world. Mm -hmm. And I've tried to attract people from developing countries who are trying to get to the developed world. And when you look at the migration, right, what is it saying to us? That we're profiling. We're not really recruiting one human profile. We're recruiting people that look like us, because otherwise, we won't have Mexican coming to the US, right? If today, a job description, you look at it and you say, you, you know, you, you, you pull everything out. Are we recruiting people from the Africa region? They rightly have the skills to come work in the US because we're not one world. We're so divided. It's not only about job description. It's just the human nature that we really try to bring people that look like us. So with this world, with climate change, with poverty going really so I really would like this movement to think of migration when we are recruiting. How do we reduce poverty through jobs? So let's go create jobs in the areas where we need them the most because these people will not be eating if they have a job. So I think job description is really the biggest barrier. 
in terms of uh, reducing poverty. And I think the HR movement will really do something about that and reduce the profiling. And hopefully technology will not stop Africans to get to the first world. Okay, Joe, I'm going, going behind you first, and then I'm coming to you. She's all the way in the back. This is how I get my steps in. Hi, my name is Ashley. So two quick comments, because um, I'm a really big tech geek and profess love for technology. But I do think that we're getting to really scary times um, where we're really losing, losing the human element. Um, I've recruited and I've built out teams for over a decade. And I think that when we talk about job descriptions being broken, I think resumes are really broken. I think most people don't know how to market themselves. They don't know how to tell their story. And you don't know how many times I've looked at a resume and I didn't think someone was a fit but I had a conversation, five minutes, and I was so surprised. And I actually have hired those people. And so I think that when we talk about internally within organizations that being broken, I think we also need better ways and resources to help candidates and to help people looking for work to really be able to market themselves. Um, and then also internally, I think, you know, we do engagement surveys, we use a lot of technology to get feedback, but nothing really trumps having a one-on-one -on -one conversation with someone, going out for a coffee chat, walking around the block, and I, I worry that, we go so far into technology, you know, and things like Slack that we lose sight of having human interactions and human conversations. But then it's kind of scheduled the coffee and, you know, walk in the park. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right, Joe, I promised you. Great. Thank you, Jill. So I come from this from a little bit different background. I grew up, half of my career was in technology, and then I found a need and didn't have a lot of support in HR, so I went back to school, and then the other half of my career is in HR. So long before the intersection of HR and technology, I did that. So everybody thought I was crazy, everybody thought I was nuts, I heard all this noise, why would you want to go from technology into HR? It was a need. I was managing a group of people, and I didn't have the support I got. So my perspective is, there is a need for both. There isn't, like Enrique says, there's an intersection of HR and technology here. And it's finding that right balance. So the right balance is, yes, we all follow hacking HR in between our meetings. We connect with people. And that's the same thing with organizations. So it's not all for one and one for all. It's a combination. It's a hybrid solution. So with recruiting, I was looking for a job. They came up with this little thing, and it was artificial intelligence, automated, where you had this little video. At first, I was like, what is this? This is so impersonal. Well, you know what? I tried it. I tried it again. The first time it bombed, I tried it again. Same company, no joke, same company. Did it three different times, three different recruiters. So I got much better at it. The third time, I went much further. So my level of comfort was, is obviously different because I grew up with technology. But I think there's no one answer to this. It's clearly a hybrid solution, and it's gonna, you're going to build it, and you're going to build trust with the technology piece. Right now, if somebody doesn't have that trust, it's like a human. It's, it's just technology. You can call it whatever you want, AI or what, what have you. But there's a room for both in, the, in companies moving forward. So thanks, Thank thanks you. for my two cents. I want to speak to the last two, two comments. Um, because together, I think they're very, very important. Um, I think it's important when you bring a systems lens to the world and to organizations that it often is a both and, and, and. People, technology, as well as bringing an equity lens to that work, right? If you look in the United States or you look globally. And a concrete example I have of the beauty of when you merge people, technology, and I would add an equity lens, right? is right now, United Web New York City, I mentioned that every four years we work with the University of Washington to update the self-sufficiency standard for New York City, where we actually look at income and ad adequacy across the borough. And we use technology and big data sets where you can go in and put in your family composition and figure out how much does it take to make ends meet in this neighborhood or that neighborhood, child care, transportation, all of those things. So that's, so that's the beauty of big data and technology. And where the human and the equity lens comes into that, particularly when you do systems change, is we've partnered with Starbucks. Starbucks is looking at their own employees and they're saying, we realize given this data around self-sufficiency that the wages we are paying for the people who work for us 
aren't really working? Will you partner with us to really use that data to see where our employees are and then partner with us to match them with community based organizations or other social supports that can help them meet that standard. So those three things together, people, technology, and really understanding social identity, culture, equity, right, can really break down those barriers, those systems, those conditions that are holding these problems in place. But it requires collaboration and it requires you bringing all of these skills together, back to the interdisciplinary, the multidisciplinarity, right, to be able to solve complex problems. I have something very exciting. We're about to cut off, but we have a Facebook Live question. Oh. <laughs> let's, let, let's do it. We didn't know this was happening. Speaking of technology. <laughs> and it's from the amazing Rebecca Oppenheim. And I was told to cut us off at 7.45, but when I get a Facebook Live question, <laughs> I feel like I've officially made it. <laughs> All right. This is going to be our last question, and I apologize in advance because there's so many people who've, who have questions, but that is the beauty of this. After this, I'm going to bring up Ashley and Ali, who are going to talk more about joining the Hacking HR New York chapter, where we will have the opportunity to talk more about talking more about these kinds of topics. So, Rebecca asks, how do you see company culture evolving in the gig economy, how can leaders bring independent contractors and gig workers into their internal culture when they may work for multiple companies? No worries if there isn't time to answer this question. <laughs> um, and so why don't we have um, one or two of you take a crack at this question. Um, you know what, Claude, if you could hit this one, because right now you're in a chief people officer role, um, and then Dennis, I see you're gonna eat your microphone, so you hit it too. <laughs> I'm gonna give the 30 second answer. I would love for the gig economy to somehow allow for all of their associates to get equity in the company. So those three million Uber drivers, they should own Uber, not uh, Travis. I love that. Does Travis still own it? He's got 10%. <laughs> um, so we support uh, side hustles for sure. I work for an entrepreneur. Uh, we have the, uh, the theory that if you can get your job done in five hours, six hours, whatever it is, you have your side hustle, you have two side hustles, you have three side hustles. It encourages uh, entrepreneurship, it encourages possibility, it encourages curiosity, and quite frankly, collaboration, which we just bring back into the organization. So side hustle are us. Rebecca, thank you for joining us on Facebook Live tonight. Um, and thank you for your question. And before I bring up sure. these guys, I want to say that standing up here on a panel with each of you five amazing people, Jackie, Dennis, Claude, Rita, Mike, is an absolute honor. You guys were incredible. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank Jill. You, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, Thank Jill. you. <laughs> Um, thank you, Rich, for everything you do. You are amazing. Enrique, the amazing Jessica Dubois for helping us keep time. Um, and now I would like to invite our panel to take the red carpet black couch and uh, invite Ashley and Ali up to talk to us more about Hacking HR New York. Wow, thank you. Thank you guys, everybody, for coming out. It's, uh, it's a stormy little weather out we're having today. This is the second time in New York that we're having a little crazy weather, and this is the second time that we've had an amazing turnout. So kudos to New York City, to New Yorkers. I won't kill the whole thank you for again for Enrique of uh, being our founder uh, globally uh, as well as thank you so much for everybody to attend um, and thank you New York City for allowing us to be a host to um, the forum and the hacking forum globally and um, we are definitely excited to have everyone here. We are so proud to be able to be a community, and not only a community of HR, but a community of business, entrepreneurs, and of content managers, right? So we're all about content, content-driven, content knowledge, not just kind of talking 
just to talk, right? So thank you so much. And since you guys are New Yorkers, you're all here in New York or the tri-state area, we have a New York City chapter. And we are excited to have you all be part of us, not only as, um, like, uh, as guests and as audience, but also be as, as participants, right? Ashley? Yeah, so obviously Hacking HR has been a movement for over a year, super exciting, all the great work that Enrique has been doing. Uh, forums that have been running twice a year in a lot of major cities. Uh, the next fun journey in this evolution is chapters. And so chapters have been spinning up all over the US, actually globally as well, which is super exciting. Um, Ali, myself, and Anne, who couldn't be with us tonight, uh, launched the New York City chapter last month, which we're super, super excited about. Um, so for those of you that braved, for those of you that braved the torrential downpours about a month ago, it was really, really awesome. Uh, we're in planning stages for our next event, gonna kick off in the new year. Ultimately, the chapters are getting much more into some of these challenges, much more digging into a lot of these fun problems and, and potentially coming up with solutions. So a uh, little bit different forum than kind of speaking in panel. Uh, very, very collaborative. So very much infusing design thinking, um, interactive breakout sessions, um, kind of HR labs, potentially bringing in HR tech companies run, maybe doing on a quarterly basis. Anyone that's interested in volunteering or want to find out more on LinkedIn, uh, we'll be sending out more information for kicking off our next session in the new year. Um, and hopefully some of you can join us and uh, kind of be a part of uh, Hacking HR. Let's make New York the number one chapter globally, OK? Let's not, those, let's not let those Australians or those Brazilians take over. New York City, number one. Woo! Thanks, have a great night everyone.